actually see all of you who are sitting this way, not. <laughs> that would be better, so I can. Is that better? Okay, I'll sit there. <laughs> because you're like, I'm having a conversation with you. We're having a conversation with the camera. We just happen to be in the same room. Hello, everyone. Welcome to book club tonight. I've just made everybody who's here rearrange their seating so I can smile at their beautiful faces. Um, welcome. Today we are in Prayer by Richard J. Foster, and it parallels really well with um, those who are participating with Reconnect with us. Uh, today's the Prayer of Rest, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the heart of it. Uh, prayer of Rest brings us into the presence of Jesus, and the three ways we can do it are solitude. Silence and re... Oh, is it reconnection or re-recollection? I need to look it up. Recollection. Recollection means focus. It means tranquility of mind, heart, and spirit. And we're going to talk about that right at the end of our book club. But I found it interesting on a week where we are between um, in Reconnect, the, the devotional series of spiritual practices that we're, many of us are undergoing, um, we've decided to take the seven weeks and do each week for two uh, to really ground ourselves in the practice that we're learning. So this past week and this coming week is all about silence and solitude. And the prayer of rest, he says, happens in silence, in solitude, in this recollection. So uh, there's, a, there's a very weaving together of these two different books, two different authors, two different thinkings, but there is this pattern or theme across them. And um, I've been noticing this in a lot of things. One of my professors in my undergrad, this is like <laughs> 22 years ago, got up in a sermon. And he's like, I always struggle when preaching because everything I know is linked to everything else I know. And I can't just give it all to you. I have to like segment it down but they're all everything is interconnected everything is woven together um, into this beautiful tapestry if you're preaching about love you're going to be talking about prayer if you're talking about prayer you're going to be talking about fasting if you're talking about love again you might be talking about devotion or obedience like and obedience goes to listening and listening is silence and silence is solitude and all these things are deeply interwoven together in our spiritual life which him being a systematic professor he also has like the the system I, systematic theology is my it's subject I struggle in the most I am an abstract thinker I think in watercolor splotches here and here and I I think in uh tapestries being woven together like threads um of, of themes like gold thread of God's love through the whole picture um gold love gold th red thread of his redemption story through the whole thing and I think it's beautiful I struggle with the systematic part which is a little more uh -huh. I don't know if, if a systematic professor would say this but feels a little more clinical I'm, I'm not looking forward to taking systematic theology in the next two years because I know I'm going to struggle with that class um all that to say, I do think there's a beauty in how one book that we're looking at and this book are weaving together to show us um, elements of how prayer works. Uh, so how are we all doing today? You're A-OK? -okay? We're good? We're good? We had a really good time this morning talking about Reconnect and just what God is doing through it. I put something in here. There it is. Um, and one of the things we're doing is using breath prayers. <laughs> this little, uh, I have to double check that my order actually went through because I forgot to put it in until like the 30th of April, which was the deadline. So like I need to check to make sure it got shipped. But some of these are coming. So if you would like one, speak to me. I'll, I'll give you a price point. <laughs> uh, these are just, some of them are scriptures. Some of them are just statements of Christian faith, but they can be simple prayers. So today... Huh. I don't know. I like them both. We're going to flip back because I don't think I've done this page. Lord, come to me in my distress. 
I think that might be a good one this week. We Our distress might be frustration because the car didn't turn over the right way or there's a squeal in the brakes. True story, that happened. Uh, your distress might be um, companies coming and there's nothing in the fridge or turmoil with a roommate or a crabby neighbor. Um, conflict with a family member, uh, looking at your visa bill that's overdue, whatever it is in your distress. And then there could be bigger distresses. Um, I was speaking to one family who looks like somebody might be without a job and what is the future hold and what, how will I provide for my family? Like that's a real legitimate distress. And then it could just be my teenage child just rolled their eyes at me and I want to like throw something at them. <laughs> my distress today, um, I got my final paper back and I really put a lot of like my heart and soul into that paper. I worked for hours on it. I, I cried <laughs> over that paper. I really thought I did an excellent job, like 85 to 90% excellent job. And I got much less than that. And I was emotionally just devastated today. I was distressed at one point I was crying on Alex's shoulder true story like I'm I'm exaggerating it and playing it up but I was in tears going to like maybe Jesus was wrong maybe I should not have gone to school what if I'm too stupid to continue that was my reaction I was distressed <laughs> this was today's prayer for me Lord come to me in my distress so that is our breath prayer for this week I hope it is a blessing to you I hope I remember it. <laughs> God, as we speak about prayer of rest today, may you bring us rest. Amen. His opening passage is found in Matthew eleven twenty eight, And that was the very first passage I ever preached. I was in Bible college and we had like one semester to write a sermon. And it it took everything in us. I remember the process. Like one week we had to give him our passage and the next week we had to tell him what we thought the big idea of the passage was. And the next week we had to give him a point, like our point. And then, the, so like it was broken up over an entire semester and then we had to preach it in person over a video camera. And then we had to watch ourselves back. Oh. And the whole time I'm like, it has taken us an entire like term, 15 weeks maybe 14 weeks, 14 weeks to write this sermon. How am I ever going to do this process in a week? <laughs> oh, I was so young then. Uh, but my very first sermon came out of Matthew eleven twenty eight. Fun fact, driving in on this Sunday, Alex looked at me. He's like, I know Pastor Thomas like is coming back yesterday or Friday, but what if they had problems with the flights and we haven't heard about it? do you have a backup sermon? <laughs> and I went, you know, I think I do. And God took me back to this passage. So at the time in Bible college, it was how do you have peace in the midst of the chaos of the Bethany life? Because it was right around midterms or finals when I finally preached. So college life is chaotic in, in, in its way. You're balancing all of these expectations and a social life and extracurricular. Um, <clears throat> I could easily say, how do we have peace in a post-COVID world? How do we have peace um, in the trials of life? Um, I've used this sermon once. How do we have peace in the chaos of the Christmas season? The passage that it takes you to gives us all of these answers. Come to me, this is Jesus speaking, come to me all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. It's the promise of Jesus. Now, his next words are, take my yoke, learn from me, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your soul. I might have forgotten a word in there because I haven't actually memorized this, um, but this is the heart of it. How do we have rest? Uh, the quote to start this chapter off says, rest, rest, rest in God's love. The only work you are required now to do is to give your most intense attention to his still, small voice within. That is Madame 
Jean Guyon. Oh, isn't that a great, like, part of what we've been doing this past two week or week in the silence and solitude, just learning to sit in the stillness, listening to the still small voice. Um, if you've been doing reconnect with us, one of the passages was found in first Kings 19, where Elijah, first of all, he sleeps and he eats. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is have a snack and take a nap. You laugh, but it's true. Sometimes the thing that your body needs is a good night's sleep and full of supper. Um, I also think the beauty in that story is God provides what we need for the journey he's about to put us on. In, in Elijah's case, it is sustenance for a long journey, a physical long journey. But I think God also puts in place things for the journey of this church becoming the church, like growing in who God wants us to be. That's a spiritual journey we're going on. For each of us who are asking, yes, I want to reconnect with you, God gives us what we need to, to do that. Um, those are tidbits of Liz thoughts that are just continually coming to mind because everything's interconnected. Okay. Through the prayer of rest, God places his children in the eye of the storm. That's not where I want to be. I've watched sea drama movies, and the eye of the storm is never where I want to be. I've seen pictures of hurricanes coming and hitting Florida, and, and uh, where did Marie hit? I know the country. It, not the country. It's part of the United States. No, no, no. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was devastated by Maria, what was that, five years ago, four years ago? Time flies. One of my professors used to say, we are in the center of God's hand. It might be in the whirl of a storm. The center is the safest place. Um, I also had a professor who used to say, I'm immortal. I will live to forever until God is ready to call me home. <laughs> I'm like, okay, which isn't isn't wrong but he also does some really dangerous like goes to some dangerous countries because he's like god's gonna keep me alive until he calls me home i'm like oh that's that's faith there through the prayer of rest god places his children uh, in the eye of the storm when all around us is chaos confusion deep within us we know stability and serenity and that is the prayer of rest um yeah, this whole page is just the invitation of Jesus to come and rest. Today, this very moment, Jesus is inviting you, inviting me into his rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. I forget that part. Uh -huh. And you will find rest for your souls. And one of those, like, comes out of Sabbath and Sabbath rest. We are promised by the writer of Hebrews that a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. Those words have been uh, familiar to me from my earliest days as a Christian. Um, but I learned more recently about Sabbath prayer. And he goes on to talk about the story. He's at um, some type of retreat. He doesn't go into details. Um, it was on the Pacific coast of Canada which I would imagine he was out in BC area. I mean, he could have been up near Yukon, but I I'm going to guess BC. Um, and it was a morning break, and he found a canoe, and he, he went out for a canoe ride. I don't know if he was right on the Pacific Ocean for this, or he's on, like, a lake near the Pacific Ocean, because it doesn't go into... Okay, well, I want to make sure to give him credit. Well, on a small island off the Pacific, no, nope, off the Pacific Ocean of Canada, I was with a small study group, and during a morning break, I found a canoe and paddled over to a tiny island. Beach of the canoe, I explored this fir, found some trees. So he's sitting there, and God invites him to sit. And he's feeling nurtured by God until... Uh, I paddled over to a lovely spot, not to pray, not to explore. Sitting there, however, I recall uh, Carolyn's, Carolyn's goodbye words to me at the airport. I want you to come home refreshed. Soon I found myself simply praying, 
Refresh me, Lord. Refresh me. That's another great breath prayer. Uh, a breath that's as simple as just saying the, like, breathing in the words, refresh me, Lord. It is not hard to wait in silence. The entire outdoor scenery seemed to hush in reverence. And then I asked, I want to, to teach you to, I want to teach you, oh, this is what God said to him. His conscious mind heard God say, I want to teach you Sabbath prayer. I leaned forward in anticipation. I was far more, I was far from sure what Sabbath prayer was, but I was eager to learn. You will have to lean, leave me because I don't know what I am do, supposed to do. I, I responded. Then the words came, be still, rest, shalom. That was all. Those words and no more. For some moments I sought to enter into the experience with each word. The encounter was wonderful. But I was also aware of the time. And I've been there. Do I need to be somewhere right now? I love this watch that my delightful husband got me as a wedding gift but there are times where i'm doing something and i'm just like okay okay i was doing that this morning in prayer more because i knew i was at 10 30 we needed to end our one discussion to start morning prayer and there were times like i should have just let the room be but i'm here going okay well i know this person needs to leave this time so we need to start praying at this time and even in this really good discussion about rest and silence and sitting with Jesus, I kept looking down at my watch. So there's a confession for you. <laughs> um, I came concerned and thought, it's nearly noon. People will be missing me, wondering where I've stayed so long. I have to get back before lunch. The same words were spoken over me. Be still, rest, shalom. They seemed to calm my spirit and I returned to silent or quiet attentiveness. After a while, however, my mind became agitated by the kind of hyper-responsibility. Perhaps you know the feeling. The next session is starting soon, I reasoned. This is what I was going through uh, today as I made that confession a few moments ago. I need to be there. What kind of example will my truancy make? Besides, everyone will really begin to be concerned about my absence. In full near here now, my mind began envisioning self-centered uh, surrealistic serenity. People might be thinking I tripped it over in a canoe, and right now they're probably discussing whether or not to mount, uh, mount a rescue effort. The same words were ser served as discipline to my mind. <coughs> be still, rest, shalom. The final tem temptation, however, was the most alluring. I began thinking to myself, this experience is absolutely wonderful. I must capture this moment for the future, but how? I cannot possibly remember everything that's happening here. Where is some paper? I must write this down. And there are times, I think, where writing down things are important. Um, I think there is a profound ability that journaling uh, has to hold on. If you reflect, they can be mile markers to show what God has done. Sometimes commitments stick better when you physically use a pen and paper to write down that and mark the day and mark the time, mark the commitment. I am all about journaling. I've been in this trap because sometimes God still just wants you to stop because the words were be still, rest, shalom. All the more focus, I settled back into Sabbath prayer. In a short time, it seemed like the presence in the midst, midst ended. So I made my way back to the group which, as you probably guessed, had scarcely noticed my absence. <laughs> so that's, that's his experience with rest. And there are times where I have definitely had that. Um, this past summer, I was able to go up to northern Ontario with Alex, visited family who have cottage there, and being out on the lake. When we didn't feel the pressure of the wind against us, when we were just could canoe in the direction and there was a stillness there were times you and I weren't talking we were just there um hiking can do that walking can do that even for some of us knitting or or a tap po peeling potatoes for me can sometimes be that if you have to do a lot for some family thing that that repetition of action 
can be peaceful giving, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's, that's our starting place. <clears> Today <throat> we are invited into the Sabbath rest of God, which uh, the children of Israel failed to enter. It remains open for us to enter into it, declares the writer of Hebrews, literally translated the, uh, from the, the little translation for prayer, pray always, is come to rest. Through the prayer of rest, we enter this intense stillness, this quiet alertness. And that is what we've been talking about in Reconnect. Like there's this tie-in again of starting our time with God in stillness so that we can hear or that we can just be. Um, I think a couple weeks ago I told you this thing. Ancient Hebrew didn't actually have a word for obedience, to obey. Uh, the closest word they have was to listen. So be still and know that I'm God. Like the, this whole thing, again, is wrapped up in it. So by listening to God, we discover who he is. And that is an act of obedience. <clears throat> But how? How do we enter this prayer of rest? Here, are, um, here we face a serious dilemma. Our tendency on one hand is to take firm control or the other extreme to absolutely necessary. We either hyper control this or do nothing at all. Um, I've shared the story um, Anthony Bloom tells of an elderly woman that had been working at prayer with all her might, but without sensing God's presence. So I don't know what activity she went, but she would probably got a workbook like our Reconnect. And she did it diligently, and she did all the things people recommended. And God sent, sense, her sense of God was distant. She did not seem to connect with God. Wisely, the archbishop encouraged the old woman to go to her room each day and for 15 minutes knit before the face of God. But I forbid you to say any word of prayer. You just need to knit and try to enjoy the peace of your room. Ha, huh. I wish somebody, ah, huh. yeah. I don't know if that would be a blessing or not. I'm, I'm working through a sweater right now. I'm down to just the sleeves. I have this much left of sleeve one and I haven't even touched sleeve two. I feel like I did something wrong in this part. So I'm kind of discouraged to like, finish the project because I'm like, well, what's the point? Ah, Alex says I should just do it. <laughs> Thank you for encouraging. So knitting, knitting in, in the presence of God. The woman received this counsel and her first thought was, oh, how nice, 15 minutes during which I can do nothing without being guilty. And I don't know, I, I, I err on the further side of play first because life is short. My husband is the opposite, and he is work hard, do all of the activities so that you can have peace when you have the fun time, which means sometimes I'm like, no, just come and sit with me. And he's like, but there's things we could be doing. I'm like, or you can just sit with me. Now, there's other times where he's like doing things. He's like, no, t you've had your sitting time. Now come and do things. Uh, we are good for each other. One motivates the other in areas they need to grow. <laughs> Susie is telling me I should finish my sweater as well. Okay, uh, this year, this is the year. It should have taken me a, a, a year, and it's taken me two and a couple months because it's not done yet. I started just before my birthday two years ago. Okay, soon, and this is the part I actually highlighted, but to understand the story, you had to hear all of that other stuff. I perceived that so she, soon, she said, I perceived that the silence was not simply the absence of noise, but the silence had substance. It is not absence of something, but the presence of something. As she continued daily knitting, she discovered that at the heart of silence, there was he who is in the stillness, all peace, all poise. She had let go of her tight-fisted efforts to enter God's presence, and by doing so, discovered God's presence was already there. We were having a discussion this morning about this very thing, silence. And I said, like, my professor is, when we had to have um, four or five hours on our retreat of silence, he's like, without music. 
And so many people use music to connect. I, if, if that's you, great. But there are times where you, even then, if you play instrumental hymns in the background or what, even that needs to sometimes be turned off because sometimes it is in the very silence. Sometimes even music that you enjoy or helps in many situations bring you into the presence of God, sometimes that's even a hindrance for what God might want to do in the stillness of true silence. And again, you can't turn off the hum of the lights. You can't turn, like, there are still going to be noises around you. But silence. Yeah. You were going to say something. I was just going to say that. I, I noticed that not necessarily in my time of silence, uh, even when I'm singing. I, I need to have music on throughout the day. There are times that when I really need to focus on something, I have to turn all of the music and everything to that song. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I work as a bookkeeper, and a lot of what I do right now is data entry, and it's just simple like, cop not copy paste, but like it's information transfer. I take stuff from this chart and put it in specific places in this chart. But every once in a while, I'm doing something, and you'll you'll notice it because I'll have um, an audio book on or something because. I can work at that two levels. This is copied, that matches. This copies, that matches. But sometimes I'll run into something that's a little trickier or I've transposed something into the wrong spot and my numbers no longer add up. And when that happens, first of all, I have a good cry. Uh, <laughs> I'm very emotional some days. I pause everything. Everything has to go quiet. I'm like, nope, no talking. Must solve this problem. And then I like can be... And, Anything that's slightly trickier, I need absolute silence for me to process. Um, yeah, so God meets me on both my need levels. Uh, I appreciate people who can have homes full of music and stuff, but if I'm reading a book, I can't necessarily have music on. It's one or the other. The only thing I have found um, when reading this book, and I needed to get through it quicker than my reading speed, we did get an audiobook version, so I listened to the audiobook while reading the book. That was an interesting experience. Okay, we continue. Um, so we need to find a way to move beyond the, the controlling of God, do it my way, God, or this passive um, whatever. There has to be something in the middle. Um, Prayer takes, this, okay, first of all, uh, Eugene Peterson is one of those people who has such a, had such a way with words that it grieved me so much when I heard of his passing, not from COVID, but during the time of COVID. Um, I think it was COVID. It might have been, he passed away. It was, I just, I still, he feels like a spiritual father of this time period and he shall, he is missed. Uh, if you're not sure who Eugene Peterson is as a person, he's the man who uh, wrote his own par like translation. It's a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. So if you've ever heard somebody quote from The Message, Eugene Peterson was the one who poetically uh, paraphrased it into modern language. It is not a translation. It's, it's, he's trying to capture the heart of what the scripture is saying without being word perfect. Um, and I've, I've really appreciated what he did. Some of his other pastoral care books out there are excellent. He writes, prayer takes place in the middle voice. In grammar, the active voice is when we take action. The passive voice is when we receive action from another. But the middle voice, we both act and are acted upon. We participate in formation of action and leap at the benefits of it. We neither manipulate God, active voice, or are manipulated by God, passive voice. We are involved, involved in the action and participate in the result, but do not control or define it. Middle voice. To be sure, passive or Sabbath rest sounds passive, but we also must enter into it, which sounds active. We are praying in the middle voice, entering the way of receiving and responding that radiates into a thousand subtleties, participation and intimacy, trust and forgiveness and grace. Yeah, 
I would agree with that. If if you have had an experience with Sabbath rest through silence and solitude, um, I think I think you could say amen to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there is this whole section on the activity of everlasting Trinity, but we're going to skip that and go to three classic practices, which I've already told you. I told you right at the beginning. Um, the first one is solitude. Um, solitude serves to crack open and burst apart the shell of our superficial uh, securities. Superficial securities. I don't know if it was this book or one of the other books I've read recently. I thought it was this one. This was the quote I was trying to find right before we went live, where essentially he's saying, uh, when you first come to Sabbath rest, you um, realize it helps you get through the rat race. And as you continue into that practice, like that busy nine to five life, the busyness of our world, Sabbath rest, having a Sabbath rest is kind of the thing that gives you peace in the midst of that week. But as you continue to practice it and keep it in your life, sometimes, some, at some point God uses it to go, you don't even need to live that race. I have something more for you. Um, I know when we make an effort to keep our Sabbaths, be it Saturday or Sunday or when we have a day where we do not shop because we're trying to be anti-consumerism in our Sabbath rest, when we try to limit our driving, our errands, our extras, we make exception for pre-planned gatherings with family or gatherings with friends. But when we have kind of just the <sighs> of a day, there is such, yeah, such a peace about it. I like days where we accomplish a lot and go see a hundred things and, and, and go, go, go. But I recognize I need a Sabbath rest. Um, much of what he says is very similar to what we gained from Reconnect about Jesus experienced the solitude, how much he went out to the lonely places in the desert. There was a movement in, I want to say it's the second century, but I haven't taken Christian history yet, so if I'm wrong on those dates, forgive me. It was a group of people, before monasteries were a thing, before monks monked, um, there was a group of believers who are known now as the desert fathers and mothers, and they live very austere lives. They moved out into the deserts and stayed in silence and solitude. Um, and the, the, the writing, the people, people who I read who encourage me to find rest quote them. I haven't done any real deep investigation into the desert fathers and mothers, but um, there's this whole section just talking about um, the Greek word for rest, uh, which is hysychism. Hysychism? Can you tell I haven't taken Greek yet? Refers to the spirituality of the desert fathers and mothers. Henry Newman observes that the prayer of hysychism is the prayer of rest. They discovered hychia this kind of perfect rest of body soul in the solitude of the desert. If you of us can or would ever want to follow the do- desert fathers and mothers in a literal sense, we have families, jobs, social responsibility, but we can experience solitude. This year, for example, I engaged in a splendid new experiment. In order to give practical expression of my experience of solitude, I have scheduled into my calendar four private retreats following seasons of the year, winter, spring, summer, and fall. These brief retreats of 24 hours to 48 hours, depending on my time constraints, but they will keep me in simple training program of solitude. Yeah. Um, One of my professors, who is also a pastor, um, spends in the 
summer, I think he said, he goes down to a monastery um, for, I want to say two weeks. It might be a week. But just the act of recognizing I need to leave the world and, and leave my normal routines. I think that's a, not just, I think that's a good thing to recognize. <coughs> But I think there are healthy patterns with that. We were talking about patterns today in um, this morning and the recognition of God made the seasons. Spring moves into summer, moves into fall, into winter. And how important winter is for giving the land and the trees rest. It feels like everything's dead, but God's doing things. Then the joy of new life in the spring, the growing season of the summer, and then the, the, the bounty of fall, like that rhythm. Um, and we can shape our lives to fit that. Like the fact that in the winter we are slower and, and maybe more prone to earlier nights, matching the, the sun and the sun rhythms. Uh, whereas you might have more energy in the summer and eat lighter. And then in the fall we eat heavier, preparing again, like, there are these rhythms that God has created us to have. Okay, second time honored is silence. Silencio Bruno. Has anybody watched Luca? I love that movie. <sighs> I, I kind of want to watch it tonight. Nope. We have other things to do. Um, in Silencio, therefore, we still every emotion that is not rooted in God. We become quiet, hushed, motionless. Until we are finally centered, we strip away all excess baggage and non-essential trappings until we come into the stark reality of the kingdom of God. We let go of all distractions in, until we are driving to the core, capital C. We allow God to reshuffle our priorities and eliminate unnecessary froth. Oh, I'm having a hard time with pronunciation. A silence of all uh, creaturely activities enables us to hear God. Yeah, and I think, um, I've, I've shared this a couple different places. I saw somebody talking on TikTok, Reel, whatever. It was either YouTube, Facebook, one of those things, but it was one of those shorter ones. And he was talking about creating healthy habits. And a friend of his had started going to the gym, and he would drive to the gym six months. This was the guy's pattern. And do an exercise. And I'm not talking like, 30 minutes on the trail, no, no. He lifted a dumbbell, not even a heavy one, and then went home. Six months, just showed up. Because before you can start developing your workout, you need to develop the first habit, showing up. So I think for some of us, silence and solitude, God is going to use that, but we first need to create the habit of just showing up to do these things. Um, there was a prayer a couple weeks ago that we talked about the covenant prayer of when we make this covenant, it's not for perfection. It's just, it's a commitment. God has already done everything. We, we are not earning his favor, but he appreciates our effort. Our commitment, our covenant with him uh, gives us stability to know when and where and how we're going to be doing this thing. It creates community. So for some of these things, the ultimate goal is this listening to God, but until we've shown up, reconnect is helping us to show up, to form these habits. Um, that will come with the journey of it. Okay, the third way we slip into the prayer of rest is called recollection. Oh, I read, I read that wrong or word wrong earlier. Recollection means focus. It means tranquility of mind, heart, and spirit. We look at recollection more closely when we come into contemplative prayer. For now, a brief word about this practice will be sufficient. What do we do? We pray, fully cultivate a life of reflection. We wrestle with existence clarification, who we are and what our purpose of being is. We take a private retreat just to consider our direction in life. That is the stuff of recollection. Um, Jean Vanier, Jean, Jean, 
G-E-A-N V Jean 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 V A N I E R Vanier 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 Well I thought it was honestly I want to say Jean Vanner <laughs> Jean Vignier. Okay, so now that we've had our French lesson of the day, Jean Vignier created L'Arche. Um, are you familiar with L'Arche at all, either of you? So L'Arche, there is a L'Arche in Nova, like where I used to be from, the Wolfville Kempthill area, uh, but it is an international uh, organization. It is communities for mentally handicapped people. It's often group homes. Worth looking into as an institution. Um, often explains a simple illustration to his approach of those who live at large. He will cup his hands lightly and say, suppose I have a wounded bird in my hand. So, wounded bird in hand. What would happen if I close my hand completely? Response immediately would be why the bird would be crushed to death. Well then... What would happen if I opened my hand completely? So, I have a wounded bird. Claps it tight, the thing dies. If I open it up completely, well, no, the bird would try to flap away, but it's injured and it would fall and could hurt in some way, if not die from the fall. Vanier smiles and says, right. The, pl the right place is like my cupped hand, neither totally open nor totally closed. It is a space where growth can take place. For us, too, the hands of God are cupped lightly. We, are not, we have enough freedom so that we can stretch and grow, but we also have enough protection that we will not be injured, so we can be healed. This is the prayer of rest. Let me pray for us. Blessed Savior, we are not good at resting in the hollow of your hand. Nothing in our experience has taught us resting. We've been taught how to take charge. We've been taught how to be in control. But how to rest? No, we have no models, no paradigms for resting. That is not exactly right, Jesus. When you walked among the Jerusalem crowds and in the Judean hills, you pioneered this way of living. You were always alert and alive. You lived utterly responsible to the will of God. Manifold demands were placed upon you, and still you worked in unhurried peace and power. Help each of us. Help each of us to walk in your steps. Teach us to see only what you see, to say only what you say, and to do only what you do. Help us, Lord, to work resting and to pray resting. We ask this in your good and strong name. Amen. Amen. Any thoughts on the, the prayer of rest? I, I definitely skimmed over certain sections. I would recommend going back if you have access to this book and looking at it again. Um, it feels like I got some new things out of it this time. Um, the first time I read it, the story of the knitter really stood out to me. Like that was the piece that I like the word resonated. It sung in my heart because I feel her need to try to come close to Jesus. And that's Sometimes you do everything you're right, and you're like, what's missing? And it's, I'm just holding too tightly. Um, this time around, um, that bird picture really stood out to me. So sometimes revisiting things, um, I think, is very wise. Next week, the next chapter says sacramental prayer, which will be very interesting. Um, yeah, that's where we're at. We're going to... we're. Even with a smaller crowd than we had in the winter because people are getting out and doing things at night. Um, I'm still blessed by this. I hope you are too. This might be our last no reading required book um, as life is moving back into gatherings in person. We might be changing the format. 
I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. We'll keep asking and seeking. But I do really enjoy reading and sharing my readings with you. So thank you for joining our No Reading Required Book Club tonight. This was prayer. I read the book so you don't have to. I hope you are richly blessed by God this week. Bye, friends. <laughs>